the sideline, Grandmaster. I'm a Grandmaster on the sidelines. All I ask is that you show a little respect for the sideline, Grandmaster. I ain't asking for merch. Chess was invented around 600 AD by an Indian officer who wanted to teach his men strategy and tactics. Indians taught it to the Persians, who taught it to Arab Muslims, who taught it to the Moors when they conquered North Africa in 708 AD. The Moors brought chess with them when they conquered Spain in 711 AD. General Jabal Tariq, Gibraltar, crossed the strait and landed on the rock that bears his name. 12,000 Moors defeated 70,000 Spanish under King Roderick. We, don't, we actually don't know why white moves first. We do know that originally black moved first. I have heard people use different uh, racial statements in regards to that, you know. But I, I accept it as a game and this is how it goes. White probably moved first because of the um, Caucasian influence over our, our world now. They probably, um, probably changed it. A lot of people think it's because of the racial um, context of it, of course, with white being better than black. Originally, back in the day, uh, no one wanted to be white. Black was seen as a lucky color, actually, back in the medieval times, I think. And it was also seen as a lucky color in Africa, I believe. So they felt that because black had the natural advantage, they needed to give white the first move. together is the common denominator, which is everyone thinks, the mind, the brain. Um, no matter what your profession is, your background, your living conditions, everyone has the ability to formulate a plan and carry it out. I'm a Jehovah's Witness, for example, and my faith and what I believe, I feel I have to share it with everybody. And so I can come and I can share it and nobody says, well, Remy, not today. It's still the most democratic process that I know of because when I ask them how, you know, well, if I wanted to play, what would I do? And they say, all you gotta do is knock. The chess life usually reflects the, the professional life as well. We have uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, dentists, uh, policemen. I'm a tax accountant. Um, I'm actually an enro special enrolled agent. I'm licensed to practice before the IRS. I teach high school. A certified nursing assistant, uh, working out of a nursing home. I have a master's degree. Uh, I'm a janitor. I go to school, play chess, do sports. You have a lot of um, homeless, um, people, you have people that um, have other social issues. You've got guys who have been uh, convicted felons that play. You've got guys, a couple that have uh, been gang bangers. Bugs, yeah. Oh, yeah. They mellow. Especially Cedric. I mean, yeah. Cedric is like, I point to him. I say, I say, checkmate was you 15 years ago. <laughs> if chess wasn't available, the various backgrounds that we have, we never would have synced up. It wouldn't have happened. No, we won't have that either. I done beat the man so bad he don't know. That's how it starts. See, that's the reason we can't rise as a people. Right there. All this violence. Why do they call me the sideline grandmaster? That happened at least 20 years ago. I have this irritating habit of talking in people's games. Not with some people. Some people <laughs> play. Yeah. We all do it, but the consensus is that I'm by far the worst offender. Oh, no. And the crowd goes, boo. And the crowd goes, boo. Crowd you may be right with that comment. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say that you're not right. The crowd goes, boo.
nation had lost the game, he should have won. And I was explaining to him, the game was already over, so I wasn't even talking in this game. And I was explaining to him where he had gone wrong. And he was probably more irritated with himself than he was with me, but he sort of reared up at me. And he said, you know, if you saw as much at the board as you do on the sidelines, you'd be a grandmaster. Sid, who was sitting across from us, said, he is. He's the sideline grandmaster. You know, and everybody laughed. Just kind of stuck. Now he has to go to a white square. Yeah. Yeah. Then you win the rook. Yeah. Right. When the Spanish priest, Rui Lopez, arguably the greatest chess player of his day, asked where the best chess players hearkened from, he was told Sicily produced the best chess players. It makes perfect sense. The Moors occupied Sicily for 243 years. They were in Spain until 1492, a period of almost 800 years. Here's the first documented evidence I could find of brothers playing chess. It's from the Castigas de Alfonso X, the first chess book ever published in Europe. It was commissioned by the Spanish king, Alfonso X, in 1283 AD. By then, the Moors had been an occupying power in Spain for 572 years. In 1913, H.J.R. Murray published A History of Chess. It's known as the most important history of chess that nobody ever read. He established conclusively that the Castigas de Alfonso and every other book published in Europe for the next 630 years lied about who taught them how to play chess. And they did so, at least in the first instance, in a book that included portraits of the brothers who actually taught them how to play. They all claim to have learned it from the Greeks, or the Hebrews, or anybody but the Moors. Of course, Murray himself was a card-carrying racist. When chess entered Western Europe, it took its place for the first time in the mainstream of civilization. There it became subject to those laws of development and progress which were working in all other branches of human activity. By his reckoning, civilization didn't begin until the Moorish conquest ended. He does grudgingly acknowledge that the Spanish learned chess from the Moors, even though they lied about it, but denies the Sicilians did. He developed this model to show that it takes at least 100 years for the game to permeate the culture. However, he was under the mistaken impression that the Moors were only in Sicily for roughly 60 years. The Moors were an occupying power in Sicily for 243 years. They remained a presence there for 413 years, four times the period required. Uh, they normally call me either Little Phil, BBK, Heavy Hitter. It's, it's either a mix of the two. I started learning how to play chess when I went to Borders. I just saw the guys playing at Borders and I was like, oh, this looks like a fun game. So I decided that I wanted my dad to teach me how to play. And we went to Walgreens and got a little plastic set that had the instructions on it. And since then I've been trying to find all the locations for you, where you guys play. I normally go for a very tactical and aggressive sort of playing style, and I don't like going on the defensive just because it's it just doesn't feel right. I've learned so much and become a better person, I think, just from being around all of you guys. You've, you're like my second family. BBK is an organization that I'm the CEO of. 
The BBK, the BBK is not real. The BBK is not real. It means big boy killers. I know, cause Ted Koppel told me so. Anybody thinks that they big in bed on a chessboard, we kill them. I seen it on Nightline back in 1999. The BBK is uh, a group of guys, you know, they think they all that, but they really not. There are those of us who play at the top board, and they call us the big boys. And the up-and-comers, they, they call themselves the big boy killers. We, we have um, chess gangs that have formed. We have the hooker gang. Um, we have the uh, BBKs. I am the head hooker. I started the hooker organization. The, the thing you want to keep in mind about hookers is hookers hooker ties. <laughs> I uh, encourage all the people to hook any and everybody up that they play chess against. This once was the BBK arch enemies on the chessboard. Is that no more? No. Why not? Because we, we passed them up. They refer to big boys as the better chess players. A hooker is one faction of chess players that chose to get themselves that name to compete with another uh, the set of chess players called the BBK. It's just, it's almost like a little fun chess gang, really. I refer to the BBK as the BBWs, big boy wannabes. Playing most people with my left hand, right. and I don't tell them that it's, it's, it's my hard hand, until they start winning. Oh, yeah. We play blitz, five minute games, which means you have five minutes to make all your moves. But even in Blitz, sometimes you have to stop and think. The first African American to publish a book on chess was the former slave, Theophilus Thompson. It was a book of chess problems entitled Chess Problems either to play or mate, published in 1873. He was known in white chess circles as the colored chess champion. His tournament record shows that he resigned a lot, even in positions where there seemed to be no reason to resign. He did much better in correspondence play, winning seven out of nine games in one tournament. Apparently, so long as he wasn't sitting across from his white opponents, it was okay for him to win. Of course, there were a number of white players who simply refused to play him. Sir, I will not play with any white man who would so far forget himself as to play with a nigger. Furthermore, I will not condescend to play with a white man who played with a white man who played with a nigger. It wasn't always that bad. James McCune Smith was the first licensed physician of African descent. His mother had been a slave, but he was born free, like his father. He was an abolitionist and confidant of Frederick Douglass. He wrote the introduction to the second edition of Douglass's autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom. He and his friends, all free blacks, attended the first American Chess Congress in New York in 1857. They were all abolitionists. Charles Reason was the first African-American mathematician. George T. Downing was a hotelier and businessman from Newport, Rhode Island. According to Smith, who wrote an article about the experience in the abolitionist press, they weren't denied entry or harassed in any way, in spite of the presence of Southern slaveholders and the hint of rebellion in the air. In his essay, he explained why they went. Having seen their portraits in Frank Leslie, we instantly singled out Paulson and his great antagonist, and a little skillful elbowing found us seated beside their board. There was Louis Paulson with his vast head, sanguine temperament, but coarse fiber, indicating his rough, almost pure, berserker blood. And as we gazed at Morphe, with his fine, open countenance, brunette hue, marvelous delicacy of fiber, bright, clear eyes, an elongated submaxillary bone, a keen suspicion entered our ethnological department that we were not the only Carthaginian in the room. It might only be one drop, perhaps two. God only knows how they got there. But surely beside the tree of Mulatton, 
who at present writes, there was a Hokata Malatin in that room. In other words, they came to see a brother whoop some white ass. At the tender age of 20, Paul Morphy took the chess world by storm. No one had ever seen before the kinds of combinations he seemed to play as a matter of course. Many of the chess principles we live by today, rapid development of the pieces, opening lines, placing pieces aggressively on open lines, and most especially, direct attack on the king, were garnered from Morphy's games. It's no exaggeration to state, there was chess before Morphy and chess after Morphy. And by the way, the suspicions about Morphy were correct. Morphy's grandmother was black. Keep in mind, in 1857, one drop of black blood meant you were black. When Paul Morphy won that match, he didn't just become the first American chess champion, he became the first African-American chess champion. This was about black pride for these singularly accomplished brothers. Not just for them, but for the readers of the abolitionist press as well. It was the original Joe Lewis versus Max Schmeling. So what you had on that day was the very first African-American doctor, the very first African-American mathematician, and the very first African-American chess champion, all in the same room at the same time. It's a shame they couldn't do a fist bump or something. Maybe get a game in. He could have given them some pointers. It does make me wonder what that unnamed racist would have thought back in 1882 had he known that the very first American chess champion was, to borrow his phrase, a nigger. I should mention there is a certain amount of controversy in the academic literature on this point, but not for these brothers or their readers. For them, it was a settled question, but you won't read that in the academic literature. America, it seems, is utterly incapable of seeing things from a black point of view. What's the what's the movie? No, you, you should have played Quick Take. I should play that? Yeah, Quick Take. I had that. Because he can't get out. In other words, he's made one. That's made one. Yeah. He took with the pawn to so that bishop there. And Quick Take was, was, oh, was quicker. Murder, that. death, kill. There's a term in the literature, it's called Zugzwang, and it means all moves lose. It's a German word. You see it in chess books all the time. It just means all moves lose. And there's a variant on that that you also see in the, in, in the literature. It's mate in all variations. And uh, murder, death, kill is our way of saying mate in all variations. In other words, if you go this way, you get murdered. You go that way, you die. You go this way, and you get killed. Murder, death, kill. I played throughout the country. I played in California, I played in Vegas, I played in Atlanta, and Chicago has one of the strongest base. Uh, as far as African Americans, they are the strongest uh, that I face. Well, I play my openings. I don't have a particular opening style. I just play, you know, just trying to get to my opponent's king as quickly as I possibly can. You know, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, This, the kind of chess players we have in the club now they're very different than when I was coming up because we wanted to play the blessed players. We read, we worked on our fundamentals. I was never a, you know, book player. I play, you know, off uh, the natural reaction of my, my mind, my thoughts. That's how Checkmate the Greats play. My favorite opening that I play for black is the Karakon. Um, pr pretty notorious for that. And uh, for white, um, I have my own system, uh, which I call the Muhammad. Well, these guys just like, if you notice some of the other interviews, they talk about, well, I play my own system. Okay, you spend hours playing this game. Why wouldn't you try to learn more from it? I'm not a book player. It's like a piano player play, play by music, by hearing the music instead of by notes, looking at reading the sheet. Well, that's kind of the chess style I have. I play the English opening, Budapest Gambit. With white, I predominantly play the English when I uh, play, and with black, I just invented my own. I don't know if there's a name for it. I might just call it the hooker opening. It's just quicker, <laughs> right? No, that's all. That's murder that kid. So what's that's the other way? way. No, no, but this is murder that kid. I'm just saying, he could just make it. You right, you right. And the crowd goes boom. Oh, oh, you right, my heart. Oh, boom. 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 Boom
We usually say that when a person make a blunder or neglect a good move and the people on the sidelines see it. I actually was not aware of its origin, that it came from one of our extremely strong players, Baby Al. Um, but it's a term, once again, that Kirby uses a lot. And the crowd goes boo. The crowd goes boo. That, uh, 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 um, Baby Al was, uh, he was one of the strongest uh, chess players in our little thing. He, uh, he, 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 um, he died in a car accident about uh, 15 years ago, uh, he and his wife. Yeah, his name was Al Hammond. Uh, he would rag on me because he always thought I had more potential than I uh, uh, demonstrated at the board. Uh, he, he was my friend and I like to try I, I like to try to remember him, you know. I, I, don't, I don't. Yeah, he was uh, a real good friend. I miss him a lot, man. It's, it, it just kind of makes me feel like he's still there, you know. God, they don't like it sometimes when I do it, but I always remind them that's what I always say all the time. Could, could I just have a minute? A little lightweight young you did. I don't know. You don't know what a little lightweight young you did is? I thought all you kids knew what that was. <laughs> that can be a, a check, a young check. In particular, like, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I see it, it's a light check, but it's a check. Your kid gets possibly exposed. You know, you're gonna simply get out of it, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this, this check on you. A young you dig is check. A little lightweight young you dig, that's me. Yeah, it's game over. You're done. Oh, okay. Right. Push, you, you're doing what's otherwise known as pushing wood. You're doing the best you can. With the limited resource available to him. Uh, uh, uh. Watch your hands, pretty Tony. <laughs> Be careful. Oh. Be careful, baby. In a recent issue of Scientific American, they did a study of why chess players make second best moves. They see it as some sort of proxy for suboptimal decision making generally. Marvin's been lecturing us about second best moves since forever, so I read the article with some interest. He's listed as one of the top 10 African American chess players of all time. Another name on the list, Emory Tate, was a founding member of our little ramshackle of a chess club, the BFOC black fraternity of chess players. They set up a mate in five. It was a specific type of mate known as smothered mate. They gave it to a bunch of experts, masters, and grandmasters to solve. They all found the solution. After they solved it, they were informed there was another, quicker solution. They were encouraged to find the better solution. After checking and double checking, the experts and masters were convinced there was only one solution, the one they found. The only ones who found the quicker, better solution were the Grand Masters. Some of the Grand Masters actually found both solutions on their first attempt, but they all found it when prompted. Since we have experts and masters as members, I decided to ask them what they thought. The Grand Masters look at the board totally different. I mean, they look at piece, how the pieces coordinate with the squares. We tend to just see pieces and moves and combinations. They look at the board and they look at how the pieces correlate to the squares. Some people have just pattern recognition when it comes to chess. They can just see a pattern and they can solve it fast. It's not that grandmasters are so much better, but they have a lot more experience. A lot of chess problems is solved in pattern recognition. Chess is a, is a god complex. Uh, when people play chess, they literally feel like the world is in their hands, that they're in full control of everything that happens. 
So when they determine that something is their will, or they feel like uh, their plan is the best, then it's very hard for them to humble themselves and begin to see that there are other alternatives or other wills that can be brought into existence. That doesn't look good. Could I have, could I have, yeah, I could have. Check. Yeah, I did, exactly. I, I gotta move over, I gotta move over. I know, I don't exactly know how that happened. This is a, this is a, this is a, this is a terrible turn of events here. Yep, so, good game, good game, good game. As you can see, chess is about pattern recognition and ego. At least the way we play it, it is. Researchers concluded that the only way to ensure against second best moves in life or in chess is to reach the top of your profession. You don't want to stop after you get your master's degree. You want to go ahead and get your PhD. That way, even if you make a second best move, there's still a chance you'll find a better solution, either on your own or after prompting. Who knows? It may even apply in matters of love. Well, you don't want to settle. You want to go all the way. You don't want to make the second best move. This is just one of the ways in which chess still contributes to our understanding of things that have nothing whatsoever to do with chess. But remember, there's only one sideline grandmaster. Often imitated, never duplicated. Accept no substitute. I'm the sideline grandmaster. I'm a grandmaster on the sidelines. All I ask is that you show a little respect. For the sideline grandmaster, I ain't asking for merch. Thank you.